19th century philosophy, or sometimes as it's called late modern philosophy, is an area that has been, at least in recent years, not paid as much attention to as it probably deserves. It's an area that I am particularly interested in, in which I do a good bit of my scholarly work and devote a lot of my reading and attention to. And I was asked a, a question uh, a few weeks ago by one of my viewers about which figures, which would be the top figures that I would recommend if somebody was going to study 19th century philosophy. So I thought, aha, good, I'll do another top ten list. Um, and as I started drawing it up, I found that it was very difficult to, to carry out the kind of triage that was being demanded. I was um, scratching some, you know, thinkers out very reluctantly and trying to insert other thinkers and saying, well, you know, we need some sort of representation of this, this group here, this school. Uh, how, are, how are people going to get a good spectrum? And long and short of it is, uh, if you're going to confine yourself to ten thinkers, you're not going to get an adequate representation of the full spectrum of what's going on in 19th century thought. And unfortunately, that's what often happens in classes where, where 19th century philosophy gets taught. If it's taught as a standalone course, it'll often just be German idealism plus existentialism plus John Stuart Mill. Or maybe if the instructor is particularly interested in pragmatism plus William James. Or, you know, and we could do this with a lot of other things. And it's unfortunate because there's there's such rich thought there that deserves um, being made part of one's philosophical development. And I think that, you know, in the current philosophical milieu, there's so many people that you could study that by the time that we get to the 19th century, people are often worn out. And if we're looking at it the other way around, there's so many, um, you might say, not necessarily hasty, but need to be called back and question judgments that were made from the vantage point of the 20th century about the quality or, or value of 19th century thought that one, you know, if one is really a philosopher, one actually ought to read the text oneself and then make a, a judgment based on that rather than listening to Bertrand Russell or, you know, uh, any, really any of the people who are sort of saying, well, that, that stuff, that's been done, we don't need to, to think about it anymore. Because there's a lot of really brilliant stuff going on, even in the thinkers that we think that we know really well, like Nietzsche or Hegel or John Stuart Mill, once you probe beneath the surface or you actually attentively read the text, you find out there's a lot more going on than you, you might at first have thought. So what I want to do here, instead of giving a top ten list, is to, I will highlight some philosophers in particular, and actually I'm sticking fairly close to uh, an article or an encyclopedia entry that I wrote um, some time ago, which I'll put the link in my uh, video description, so you can access it and print it out if you want to, about 19th century philosophy. I was confined to uh, a limited word count, so there's other people that I would have put in, and I would have said more about them, but, you know, uh, you got to work within the limits that you're you're assigned. So, um, what I want to do is talk less in terms of particular figures as the centerpieces, and more in terms of philosophical movements or schools or particular uh, problems and thematics that they were they were working on. Um, some of these resist classification a bit more than others. It's hard to figure out exactly where to fit certain figures sometimes. But I think that um, you can identify about uh, 11 or 12 main movements or, or groupings that you can put 19th century philosophers, most 19th century philosophers into. And those are in order of, of my, you know, treating them and, and perhaps in order of, of influence, if not importance. Um, British empiricism slash uh, utilitarianism, because those often went hand in hand. That would be one major one. German idealism. 
another really significant uh, movement with a lot of interesting thinkers in it. Um, what I'd like to call German post-Hegelian philosophy rather than just calling it um, you know, late idealism or German materialism or things like that. And existential philosophy, there's going to be a little bit of overlap there. Um, American transcendentalism, uh, positivism of both the, you know, British and the French, and also a little bit of the, the German kinds. Uh, pragmatism, primarily an American movement. Uh, a rubric that I'm going to call social philosophy, under which quite a few distinct thinkers fit, who are all treating a set of common issues and themes. Um, something that a lot of people aren't really attuned to, French reflexive philosophy. Um, another, another school of philosophy that was primarily French authors, traditionalism. Uh, another is ontologism. And then we have neo-Thomism and British idealism. And those are all interesting, well-represented philosophical schools that you could, you could you know, write a whole dissertation on. You could spend years researching. Each one could, could have its own encyclopedia article because you could, you could write quite a bit about it. So let's talk about each one in turn. Um, British utilitarianism and empiricism. If I, and I'll try to be very uh, brief to keep the list very short. If you were only going to pick two people to, to focus on with this, although he's sort of straddling the 19th and 18th century, I would say that Bentham is in many respects a 19th century thinker. And so, you know, he, even though some of his works, his major works, are written in the, the 18th century, they're carrying through into the 19th century. And so I would read Bentham. Um, of course, John Stuart Mill is, he's worth reading in part because uh, when it comes to utilitarianism, not only is he making important modifications to the theory, he's also somebody who grew up within its, its worldview. He was a project. They were, they were you know, he was a, a, a child who experienced utilitarianism as a living philosophy. Um, German idealism. There's, there's a lot of figures who we could mention. Um, if we could only read two, which, one, which ones would those be? I would say uh, Hegel and Schopenhauer. Um, it's, it's nice to read Fichte, it's nice to read Schelling. There's a lot of other interesting thinkers like Jacobi who um, are, are worth spending some time on if you've got the time. But if you only had the time to read two post-Kantian philosophers who are really, uh, not just personally in Schopenhauer's case, but, but philosophically opposed to each other, I would say Hegel and, and uh, Schopenhauer. Um, once we get past Hegel and we're into, um, you know, what we could call post-Hegelian, uh, you know, right Hegelian, left Hegelian philosophy, obviously the most important person to read when it comes to that would be Marx. But I think it could be, if you could only pick one other person to read of that group, I would say Ludwig Feuerbach. Um, who is, in some respects, a predecessor of Marx, but Marx isn't picking up on everything that Feuerbach is doing. Um, they're both materialists, they're both humanists, but they both have uh, uh, interesting ideas going on. Um, existential philosophy, you know, the two main thinkers for the 19th century, and, and this is sort of, you know, reading things back would be, of course, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, but the, the connections between them are not really recognized by most people until the, the 20th century. But um, it's, it's nice that we actually have that convenient thing to put Kierkegaard and Nietzsche into, because where do they fit in schools? It's very, it's very difficult to say. Is Kierkegaard a German idealist? Well, he's not German, and um, he's, he's, he's using the language of German idealism, but doing some very different things with it. 
Uh, is Nietzsche, you know, in, in post-Hegelian philosophy? Well, he's doing something really unique of his own. So there's, there's that. Uh, now moving across the, the ocean and looking at transcendental uh, philosophy, um, I think it could be useful actually to read um, Coleridge, who, who is the guy that, he's a British thinker, and he's the guy that the transcendentalists are getting a lot of their German idealism through, um, along with Victor Cousin. But I, I would say that it, it's most important just to, to read these guys, and I would say Emerson and Thoreau are the two thinkers that you would want to look at most closely. There's there's other thinkers as well as you know in, in any movement, but if we want to keep it simple, Emerson and, and Thoreau. Um, pragmatism, pragmatism is is getting started as an American philosophy in the 19th century um, with Charles Peirce. And he originally calls his philosophy of pragmatism, and then James comes along, William James, uh, and says, aha, this is exactly what I had in mind, and he does something quite different from it. Different enough that Peirce will say, you've stolen my, my name from me, I'm going to call my philosophy pragmaticism, because nobody that's such an ugly word, nobody will steal it. And, and Peirce and James really do complement each other quite well, I think. Uh, it would be tempting to put in Royce there, but if we want to keep it simple and just say two thinkers, Charles Peirce and, and uh, William James. Um, going to this, this, this sort of broad category of social philosophy then, there's a lot of thinkers, and I'm not just going to confine myself to, to two, uh, that would be worth looking at. One of them already fits into to British utilitarianism, and that's John Stuart Mill. Uh, Mill is interested in these these issues as well, and he's engaging some of these thinkers. Um, another person who's sort of doing the same, doing similar things uh, in many respects to Mill, but not from a utilitarian perspective, would be uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, who not only wrote you know Democracy in America, but also a interesting analysis about why the revolution occurred, the French Revolution, and investigated uh, prison conditions in the United States. There's, there's a lot there. But um, I would say that there's, there's three other thinkers, well, four other thinkers that you would want to, to look at as well. One is um, Charles Fourier. Uh, he, he advocates this, this interesting phalanx system. He's trying to rethink society from the ground up and, and uh, create a more rational society. Um, Henri de Saint-Simon as well comes up with some, some interesting ideas. Uh, Max Stirner, somebody who you could fit into the sort of post-Hegelian uh, area is, is also somebody who fits in here, uh, not on the side of society per se, but rather on the side of the individual. And another person who I think would, would fit in with that quite well would be um, Mika, uh, Mikhail Bakunin. Um, also, you know, he, he's, he's really, he wants a different kinds of, kind of society, but he, he is, in effect, an anarchist. And, and, and uh, that means he's going to be standing up for the, the free individual uh, against rule. So, a lot of people with that. Um, we can also talk about uh, French reflexive philosophy, and I'm actually going to throw somebody else in here who doesn't completely fit into it, but uh, we want to talk about French philosophy to some degree. So, around the turn of the century, there's this guy who is practically unknown to anybody who's, who's not um, French, and that's Man de Biran. And Man de Biran has some really interesting analyses of the mind, of volition. In, in, in some respects, he's a way to bypass Kant. And there's this entire tradition in, in French philosophy that uh, people outside of it often don't know what to make of. Um, but it's, it's, it's quite identifiable as, as French reflexive philosophy. Um, on the way to that would be somebody who's an eclectic thinker, uh, deliberately, like, like Victor Cousin, uh, 
Um, but at the very end of it, we would have... I guess you could put both of these thinkers into this, this uh, light. We'd have Maurice Blondel, um, who's publishing towards the end of the century, and almost yeah, at the same time, Henri Bergson. Um, and both of them are doing somewhat similar things. They're, they're often likened to be doing phenomenology, but they're actually coming out of this, this reflexive philosophy tradition. And they revitalized metaphysics in France for the 20th century. They were extremely fertile figures. They also prepared the way for the reception of phenomenology in, the, in France in the 20th century. Um, traditionalism. Traditionalism is another one of these 19th century philosophical movements that a lot of people don't know much about. And it's interesting because it, it, it ended up having an important political effect in France uh, through the, the organization Action Française and their philosopher Charles Maurras. And then through that it influenced a lot of other regimes that we often categorize as uh, fascist or, or you know, dictatorships, but were actually integral nationalist regimes. And so some of these ideas play, come to play an important role. Um, the traditionalists would include people like uh, Joseph de Maes, and uh, Félicité Lamanet and Louis de Bonal. Um, all three people, you know, very obscure these days in the sense that barely anybody's heard of them. But um, they were actually doing some, some pretty interesting work back then. Um, ontologism is, is another uh, philosophical movement. <clears throat> that sort of arises within the matrix of um, of Catholic thought, the way the way traditionalism originally did. It was actually traditionalism and ontologism were actually both condemned. Um, the guy who often gets associated with that would be uh, Rosamini, although he is um, he's got a contemporary um, Vincenzo Gioberti who is who's also an ontologist, and they, they end up influencing the American philosopher, Orestes Bronson. Um, what else have we got? Neotomism. Uh, the 19th century, the, the second half of it, sees a revival in Catholic circles of what was not ever an official Catholic philosophy, but often for many people took on that, and that would be the you know philosophy of St. Thomas. And what had happened up until this time was that much of the, the thought of Thomas Aquinas, uh, when people were actually using it, it was mostly Dominicans and a few Jesuits that were interested in it, they would deal with it in a very schematic way, and they weren't, you know, they were, they were interested in having these manuals, they weren't interested in, in, you know, sort of approaching Thomas's thought in its own right. And Pope Leo XIII, who's really well known for um, the Rerum Novarum, the social philosophy stuff, also had an encyclical in which he said, look, we need to spend time paying attention to Thomas. Thomas actually is one of the smartest of these doctors. Uh, we need to, you know, take into account what he has to say. He never said that he's the, the official philosopher, because the church doesn't have such. Um, but it, it certainly elevated his status. And so this gets a whole movement going that is going to go full bore into the 20th century. Um, finally, we have another, you know, movement that, again, like traditionalism, uh, not a lot of people pay attention to. I think in this part, uh, it, it, because um, they think that the analytics, you know, gave the death knell to this, and therefore it's, it's not worth studying. But that would be um, British idealism. Briti you can call it British Hegelianism if you want, but it, it's really, um, you know, idealism. And Bradley would be an important figure in this, so would uh, Thomas Green, and they're well worth, worth studying, uh, I think. Um, the last thing that I want to say about 19th century philosophy, I've given you a lot of names, I've given you a lot of movements, 
I want to talk a bit about some of the main uniting themes that are being dealt with in, in 19th century philosophy, not, not exclusively. It's not as if 20th century or you know, early modern philosophy or ancient philosophy didn't, didn't tackle any of these. But they have a particular emphasis that leads to a kind of milieu that you can, you can describe. Um, one of them is making sense out of the, the effects of the Enlightenment, which is you know, very recent in, in time and is still carrying through into the 19th century, and making sense out of, in particular, the French Revolution, but also to a certain extent the American Revolution. Um, but the, the French Revolution, you know, especially, because it led to what was almost, the, you know, you could call it a precursor to a world war, you know, the Napoleonic Wars, which uh, lasted over 10 years, involved every single country in Europe uh, at one time or another, and had in incredible repercussions well outside of the, the European sphere in Africa, in Asia, in, in America, um, not only you know, militarily, but politically, economically, intellectually. Um, people ended up having to you know, sort of take sides. And there was a lot of you know, debate and discussion about well, what, what is the meaning of the revolution? Was it, first, was it a good thing or was it a bad thing? Did, you know, uh, is, is it, is it an aberration or is this the way that everything else is going? So the revolution provided a real linchpin a litmus test for, for people's thinking. Um, the analyses of the knowing, the conscious, the active, the, the working subject that were being, you know, given a lot of attention in early modern philosophy all the way up to Kant, those continued through into the 19th century, and you really couldn't avoid doing some philosophical anthropology and some epistemology if you were a 19th century philosopher. You had to explain where do our, our ideas come from, how do we work with them, how do we affect things out there in the world. Um, the, the problem of other minds begins to you know, really assert itself as, as a, a key issue, how we can understand each other, all of those sorts of things. And the 19th century <clears throat> is much more attuned to the fact that we are linguistic, that we are historical, that we are cultural, that we are interrelated beings than the, the, ninth, than the 18th century and, and, and you know, the early modern period was. Um, that's why you have so much emphasis on, on you know, language, culture, history, all these, these great themes. Uh, along with that, this is the third theme we can identify is the attitudes towards the past. It's not just making sense out of this French Revolution business and, you know, the wars and the terror and, you know, uh, the, the elevation of the peasant and all these, these, these other themes. It, it's, it's also thinking about the whole past of philosophy. So you have people like Hegel, for example, saying, well, you know, all these other thinkers, we can, we can see them as leading up to some sort of point. Or you, your narrative might be of, you know, rise and then fall, or perhaps even just fall from the beginning, right? But there's some sort of narrative there about the, the past. And there's also a narrative about the present and the future. Um, some of these thinkers believe that progress is inevitable, we still have to give it a little push here and there. We have to join in. Others think that degeneration is unstoppable as well, and we have to find ways to, you know, secure ourselves a refuge against the degeneration of, of, of modern culture and modernity and democracy and socialism and, you know, the utilitarian approach to things and modern industry. This sounds like Nietzsche, right? Uh, but, but there's other thinkers in, in that vein as well. Um, I would say uh, uh, if we want to count, you know, emphasis on the past and emphasis on the future as two different themes, we have a fifth theme 
in this, this uh, intense focus on social structure, on institutions, and in particular on class conflict and how class conflict ought to be understood and how it ought to be addressed. So that's, that's a particularly interesting and important theme. Um, finally, I would say that another key theme that, that comes up, uh, and this is one of those for and against type of things as well, is, is religion. What ought we make of humanity's uh, religious impulse, of our religious institutions? Um, Europeans and Americans at this time are, are becoming much more exposed than they were in previous centuries to other religious, great religious systems and ways of thinking about things, and they have to figure out <clears throat> how, can we, how can we reconcile all of this. Some thinkers, you know, like Marx, you know, religion is the, is the opiate of the masses. It, it, it puts them to sleep. It, it, it helps them deal with their pain, but it's really just a, a drug that they become addicted to. Hegel saw religion, uh, by contrast, as just one step short of philosophy. Not all the religions. They were like in a, you know, progress up to that point. Um, Schopenhauer thought that, that um, some of the, the Eastern, primarily Indian, religions could, could tell us much about the nature of reality, that, that Western philosophy from a Kantian perspective would also corroborate. And we could go on from there, you know. Um, the traditionalists actually felt that, that religion was one of the things that the revolution had tried to sweep away, uh, but really tried to just replace it itself with. Um, and Comte, who I should have mentioned under positivism, I'm not sure if I actually got to positivism or not, or may have skipped over it, um, wanted to replace the, the Catholic Church with a religion of humanity. So we see that, that religion and religious viewpoints, uh, institutions, beliefs, the, the past, the, the future, the nature of the divine, these are all wrapped up into one, one big theme that plays another major role. So I would say, you know, if you, there's other things as well that these guys are talking about, um, but if you if you look at these these themes, those are the things that are really motivating many of the thinkers. There's other things that we could talk about as well. You know, uh, women's uh, suffrage and and liberation and feminist critiques. That's important. There's um, you know because of slavery and its its uh, its repercussions all the way throughout the 19th century. There's, you know, important, important critical uh, movements within African-American philosophy. Um, there's other things that we could, we could talk about as well. Um, and perhaps I'm, I'm not giving them as much emphasis as, as I ought to, but this is already a lot. So to answer that, that viewer's question, you want to study the 19th uh, century philosophy? These are the sorts of things I think that you want to focus on and, and pay attention to. Again, I, I've got that um, encyclopedia entry, which is just, you know, scratching the surface but can actually get you started, linked to in the description for this video. So that might be a, a decent place to, to begin.